Prime's Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, um, when we could get through to him, because he was having trouble hearing us, told this programme that we, as a government, is keeping its options open about the possibility of a Scottish independence referendum. Now, I wonder if Scotland's First Minister and leader of the SNP could hear us talking about that, because Nicola Sturgeon joins us now. You were probably busy doing something else, Nicola. Good to see you this morning. But he uh, said... Good to see you. He said, thank um, you. Congratulations on the award, first oh, of all, in case you, we don't Nicola. get a chance to talk about it early, uh, later on. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, uh, and, and I know you and I have talked about the situation with COVID as well, and, and you've always been very supportive and, and lovely in lots of ways. But, Nicola, you know, he did say he was keeping the option open, but he said the bar to change was very high, in Westminster's opinion, because of the promise that it was a once-in-a-generation vote. So... Why do you think there's a reason, because I know you're about to have this four-day conference discussing Scottish independence, why, why do you think there's a reason to kind of break that promise of once in a generation? What is the reason that you can give to Westminster? Well, I'll, I'll give two reasons. Um, firstly, you know, we had the referendum in 2014. I think most of us who took part in that didn't think it would be revisited anytime soon. And obviously those on the independent side who uh, narrowly lost were disappointed about that. But of course, a couple of years later, uh, we had the Brexit referendum where the outcome of that has seen Scotland taken out of Europe against our will. And if you go back to 2014, uh, one of the big issues in the campaign was this assertion on the side of the anti-independence campaign that if we voted for independence, we'd be ripped out of the European Union. So there's been pretty big change in circumstances. There are many other changes, but that's the, the biggest. But the second reason, perhaps the even more fundamental one, is maybe something that is not that fashionable in Tory circles, but it is called democracy. Um, I've just won an election in Scotland with the highest share of the vote that any party has achieved in the history of the Scottish Parliament on a manifesto commitment to offer the people of Scotland a choice over their future. Uh, after the COVID crisis, um, in order that we get the opportunity to decide, you know, as all countries are doing coming out of a global pandemic, deciding what kind of society and economy we want to be. Do we want that to be determined by governments like Boris Johnson's at Westminster or do we want to take those decisions into the hands of our own democratically elected parliament and governments? So I won an election on that basis and the UK government can try to rewrite the rules of democracy as, as long as they want. But, you know, any Democrat surely has to accept the outcome and of the election. That. Actually, Nicola, we said, you know, can you, in, in a democracy, deny it? But his point was that you didn't win an outright majority. You're in no position because you formed uh, a voting alliance with the Greens. So... Um... <laughs> Well, here we go again. We're, we're rewriting. If you apply that kind of rule to Westminster, then much of what Westminster governments have done over the last few years would never have been possible. Uh, the Scottish Parliament has a proportional representation system of election. It's meant to be impossible for any single party to win an out outright majority of seats. I came within one seat of doing that. And in terms of share of the vote, we've got a higher share of the vote than any party has ever had. Uh, 72, I think, out of the 129 members of the Scottish Parliament, a very clear majority, were elected on manifesto commitments to offer people that choice. So, you know, the, the, the point I would make is this. There are differences of opinion in Scotland and outside of Scotland about whether or not we should be independent. I accept that. And that is, you know, right and proper in a democracy. So Oliver Dowden or whoever it is, is absolutely entitled to argue passionately against independence, just as I argue passionately for it. But what they're not entitled to do is to try to block democracy. It should be for the people to decide. And I've got a mandate won at an election. The, the Scottish Conservatives fought that election entirely on the platform of stopping an independence that's, that's referendum. Minister. They didn't gain a single uh, uh, percentage point in vote share and they didn't gain a single seat. They lost the election comprehensively. Democracy surely has to count for something. For First Minister, it, it, it's undeniable you have a dominant position in Scottish politics. It's undeniable that you have a manifesto commitment to do this. But we do go back to 2014, and what the government says is, you said, once in a generation. Now, the polls are showing there is a slight, a small, a smidgen 
over 50% of people who currently support independence. While it was in your manifesto, you may be attractive for other electoral reasons. Not everybody who votes for you would agree with every manifesto sure. element. So what would you say to overturn a once-in-a-generation vote? What level, what threshold above a majority of people should want independence to have another vote? The government says you should be getting up to 60% of people before they would be looking at having another referendum. So, you know, we're just here trying to, at the whim of the Conservatives, rewrite the principles of democracy and suddenly go to a position where a majority... Oh, minute, so that's, no that, that really isn't fair, because when it comes to referenda, and boy, is that being controversial, on the argument that as soon as there's a slight change of wind, we have another referendum, you would have one oh, a year. Come on. So my question, my question was asking you, what would you define makes it valid to overturn the once-in-a-generation vote and do it again? Is it just a slight majority for independence in the opinion polls? What are the criteria that... that would push it over the line? It's a question. It's not, it's... It's not a leading one. Well, well, what would deliver independence is a majority of people in Scotland voting for it. That is straightforward and simple. We can't have independence on the whim of a politician, uh, me, Boris Johnson, anybody else. Uh, we have to have a majority of people voting for it. What is necessary to give the mandate to have that referendum, to offer that choice? And I would go back to the fundamental point I made. I've just fought an election, you know, saying to people, and I, I agree with you, you know, People vote for parties in a whole host of reasons. Not every uh, item in a manifesto is necessarily agreed to by somebody who votes for a party. But, you know, nobody can say that there wasn't, you know, clarity about what the SNP was offering on independence. The Tories tried to make it a single-issue campaign and lost overwhelmingly. So the mandate is there. Whether or not Scotland becomes independent, though, is entirely a matter for the Scottish people. It can only happen if there's a majority. You're right, polls show it's on a knife edge, a poll yesterday showing yes slightly ahead, another one today showing yes slightly behind. I've always accepted that there is a big job of work for those of us who believe in independence to persuade a majority. There's hard questions to be answered uh, and there's a case to be made. I think that case is strong, but we've got to make it. On your once in a generation point, I mean, I, I don't want to get into kind of semantics here. But what was actually said is, you know, don't lose your chance here, Scotland, because you might not get another chance in a generation. Nobody can decide democracy is in a is a once uh, in a, a moment uh, chance. You, democracy doesn't work like that. We have had the UK is almost unrecognisable now to how it was in 2014. I remember doing debates where the No campaign, the, the leader of the No campaign, said that they thought the prospect of Boris Johnson ever becoming prime minister was ridiculous, and therefore people shouldn't vote yes because they were worried about that. That if we voted yes, we, we, did, sorry, sorry. we did make that point actually. And just because I don't want to run out of time on other subjects, even though I know this is one you're hugely passionate on. Let's I'm passionate on other things as well. I know, I know. And I want to talk about one you are, which is COVID. You were kind enough to, to mention uh, me, and I know we here on this programme get a great, great response to the way you talk about COVID policy in Scotland because you are one of the few politicians who has stood up and said, we've made a mistake. You admitted that it kept you awake at night on this show, what happened with care homes in the, in the beginning. Now... COVID figures in Scotland have seen a dramatic rise. You know, when you talk about hotspots generally, seven out of nine of them are in Scotland, which is mm. extraordinary. Um, is something going wrong now? And will this decision for vaccine passports that you've just made to bring in for, for nightclubs and, uh, and other areas, is that the solution? Or are you now thinking, what is happening? It's running away with us. Uh, there's a lot in there, Kate, so let me try and cover okay. it all, but as, as briefly as possible. In terms of the situation in Scotland right now, it's a really difficult, challenging situation. We've had a, a steep rise in cases. If you look back over the summer, at the start of July, we had the highest case rates in the UK. We then came down to have the lowest for the remainder of July into August. What then happened is Scottish schools went back, our schools go back. Uh, a lot earlier than schools elsewhere in the UK. So we've had a steep rise again. We think it is starting to level off, but we're not complacent about that. 
Um, in terms of vaccine passports, do I think it's a solution? I don't think there is any one single solution to this, but I think it can be part of a package of measures that allow us to contain COVID over the winter while keeping the economy open, which is what we all want to do. Can any leader, being responsible and frank about things, rule anything out in the face of this? I don't think they should. This is an infectious virus. What has happened over uh, the last few months is we've had the massive game cha changer in a positive way in the form of vaccines, but we've had an equally massive game changer in a very negative way in the form of the Delta variant, which is so much more transmissible. So this is a really difficult time for governments and countries everywhere. The pressure on our National Health Service, and we're seeing this right across the UK right now, is intense. So, you know, we've just spent a long time talking about independence. I'm not complaining about that, but my principal focus right now is on continuing to do whatever is necessary, regardless of what might be popular or not, to try to keep the country and get the country through as safely as possible. If I can just ask you very quickly on vaccine passports, there is concern amongst some who own Scottish bars that stay open late at night about what the definition of a nightclub will be and whether they're caught by it, in which case vaccine passports would be needed or they're not. Can you tell me in Scotland what a nightclub is, please? I think most people know instinctively what a nightclub is, but we are doing so. We will finalise the sort of... Uh exact definition of this over the coming days because what we don't want to do ha is have un unintended consequences and market distortion so most people know what a nightclub is but there are some pubs who might operate quite like a nightclub and therefore make it an advantage if vaccine passports were required in one setting and not the other so we're, we're doing I think rightly and properly some work with the sector to make sure we get that definition right and we'll set it out well in advance of the scheme coming in. I don't think anybody wants vaccine passports, nobody wants to be in this pandemic at all, but we know vaccination reduces, it doesn't eradicate transmission, but it reduces transmission um, and therefore I think they have a part to play and we see them in operation already across much of Europe. They've got a part to play in trying to keep us safe from COVID without facing uh, possible closures of part of the economy again. And that's why I think they are worth having as part of our package of responses. Thank you very much for joining us, First Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.